It changes so often, but it is very fluid. It really depends on whether or not I'm shooting something. Because when I'm on set and I'm shooting, my day probably involves a 4 a.m. wake up and, uh, you know, anywhere between 12 to 15 hours on set, first in a makeup chair and then shooting, and then you're back and then you'll just get to bed and start all again. Sometimes you forget who you are when you're in those periods. And I, I just shot a film called Wedding Season that I was the lead in and I would just lose track of day, night, weeks. Um, and, you know, it's quite fun because you, you get into flow of a character and that's kind of what actors live for. We want those opportunities. But when I'm not shooting, particularly now in a pandemic where I'm somewhat stranded overseas, um, I, I'm very lucky. I get to I get to make my own day. So I do a lot of writing work, a lot of advocacy work, and I, I sort of check in on on those projects. Um, but right now, it's really important to take care of health and mental health. So I'm making time for um, wellness practices as well, such as yoga and meditation. And I know that sounds kind of cliched, but it's so important. And as an Indian, I feel like I can claim that yoga is a big part of my life and always has been. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think for me, it's it just changes. And I think that's something that I always wanted when I was younger. I, I kind of abhorred a lot of structure and institutionalization of how I live my life. So it's, it's quite a free willing process right now. Well, I think it's, I've always been someone that's quite um, socially conscious. It was very important to me. You know, for example, when I went to Melbourne Uni Law School, it was very important that social justice was a big um, factor in how I chose to do my research and all of the academic endeavours that were involved in that process. But something about why I went to India to be an actor in, in Bollywood was also linked to a desire uh, to give back to the country of my parents' ancestry or their birth and my ancestry because there was a sense that I grew up in a very privileged environment and my parents might have been migrants, but they were privileged migrants. They came to Australia under the skilled migrant scheme in the 80s and it afforded me so many opportunities which has allowed me to come to be where I am today. Uh, the one thing that was a hindrance, I think, in my career development in Australia was the fact that at the time that I was choosing to choose a creative path, being of Indian origin felt like an obstacle. And it's what precipitated my decision to go to India when I was very young to become an actress in Bollywood. It's, you know, it was a childhood fantasy, but there is a point at which that fantasy has to match with pragmatism and it didn't ever really get there. But I had no choice but to go in that direction and choose to believe in a fantasy because that seemed almost mo more likely um, in terms of becoming an actor than, than working in Australia um, at the time that I was thinking of changing into the creative field. So I think now having been an actor in multiple territories and, you know, the power of having your face shown on screen, uh, a medium which is accessible to so many people, it's not lost on me that there are many young people who might have wanted to do something like that but felt that there was a glass ceiling placed upon them. So it's really important for me to be open about the fact that I had those experiences and had to persevere through them in order to give people the gumption to be able to do the same because it is possible and it's only if we unite and collectively push forth that uh, the tide really will change. Yeah, it was a lot of impulse, I'll be honest. There wasn't a lot of rational thought behind it. I am almost trying to find that part of who I am again now, just being at new crossroads and a new juncture in the road. Um, I just had a feeling, you know, I, my father always taught me about the power of intuition, and I think that that was something that really guided me when I was a teenager and allowed me to do very well uh, throughout my, you know, primary, high school and tertiary education. However, when I did start to hit those um, ceilings very early on, I, it felt like the systems were against me and there was a systemic bias that I was going to be fighting against. And so all I really had to rely on was my gut and my intuition. There wasn't any logic that I could throw at anyone about why I should go to India and... and 
start to figure out how one becomes an actor in that industry because that was a complete maze and labyrinth and web of unknown in and of itself. So I, uh, I, I relied on my intuition. I didn't really talk too much about why I was going to India. I think my parents believed I was going to study at a university in Delhi because that's what I had told them. I, so there was a little bit of a fib involved. Um, it was a white lie because I did, I did actually get an admission pass to this university, but I never spent more than four hours on that campus. Uh, and then I went to Bombay to start figuring out how one auditions and, you know, what is the process? So it was just a wild ride and I had nothing but my gut to kind of guide me. And there's a lot of power in that, I think. And I think we, as we grow older, fear comes to become a guiding force because we've been told no or somebody has said something that we start to believe about ourselves. And uh, I went through a lot of those things in my career. It wasn't easy. It wasn't like I made the decision to go from Australia to India and then it was plain sailing. I had a number of challenges posed after I got to India, which... I would still say is probably one of the most difficult periods of my life, you know, being very, very young in a new country, uh, believing that you're finding belonging because you're in your ancestral home, but yet being a fish out of water and yet being a foreigner and having to reconcile identity on a constant basis, uh, just as I did in Australia. But, you know, obviously the parameters were slightly different. So I do think that for anyone who, you know, is trying to figure out whether or not they can take risks and whether or not pathways that haven't been obvious to them are open. It's really about finding the guiding force within you. It's the, the, In situations like this, you're not going to have mentorship in the same way that you might have if you were following a traditional career path, and that's unfortunate and that's something I would like to change. But um, we need to make sure that... That, that we have self-belief and that the no isn't an obstacle. Oh, well, I think one of my, I suppose, grievances when I was younger was feeling like I was all alone in this quest. And, you know, a big part of what I believed in my whole life was that the hyphen of my identity, the hyphenated identity and existence that I lead was incredibly valuable and powerful. And it was like a boon, it was a strength. And it was that I'm very fortunate that I had very, I have to commend my teachers at school. I went to a great school, both high school, primary school, university, where they always made me feel like I was capable of doing well. And uh, I think that that was probably a bigger influence than my own parents growing up in terms of how I formed my sense of self and my, my capabilities. And then when I was, so when I went to India and all of a sudden I was devoid of that support and those, no systems to sort of give me a pat on the back and say, we'll catch you if you fall or please take risks, um, we're watching over you. And I was totally alone. I didn't even have, I guess, a familial uh, or parental support group to, to go to and say, this is what I'm doing and it's incredibly hard because culturally what I chose to do is incongruous with the academic family that I grew up in. And so there was this extra layer of pressure and there was an extra layer of guilt and shame and so many things that become embroiled in your personal journey, particularly for many children of immigrants where those cultures do have a lot of that. And, and you know, my parents are wonderful people. It's unwitting that that was passed down to me, I would say. But a consequence of that was that I, I, went, I went upon this journey extremely alone and um, didn't really talk about how hard it was at the time that it was very hard. And today, I think my parents see that. They see what the last decade has been and they've, they've witnessed me go from Bollywood then choosing to come back to Australia when, and almost dismantle a career I had built from scratch because I believed so strongly in my Australian heritage and the fact that I should be able to work in the country of my birth um, because I feel so strongly about being an Australian woman. And I think they've just witnessed me crusade in a way through my work um, because I believe in, in that identity so strongly and 
it's now an incredible source of joy for them and pride that the choices they made have um, in some sense enabled this for me. And I think they're proud Australian people. My, my father always says, my daughter went to India and she did the hard yaka all on her own. <laughs> Uh, and and so for him, it's an example of a an identity that he's incredibly passionate about. So you know he's a very active community member, and you know coaches senior citizens in the Indian Australian community on civic matters. And my parents have made a wonderful contribution to um, Australian society through their work bringing together communities and I think their legacy and their example has has led me here so it's it's not separate from from who they are oh my god thank you so much that's so generous that's so generous I'm embarrassed I'm not used to winning anything Thank you so much. My parents will be very proud. <laughs>